My name is Cass Phillips, C-A-S-S-P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S. -L -L I'm a member of the Pearl Harbor Survivors uh, Group here in Pensacola. Now, if you could take us, you know, we'll start off with uh, the, the iconic incident, Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. So I believe you had a story the day before that you mm -hmm. clearly remember. Take us through the day before sure. Pearl Harbor. A friend of mine by the name of Bruce Smithy, who was uh, in the uh, squadron with me as a radioman, as I was, a member of a flight crew, uh, and I uh, had been out that night with a couple of girlfriends, and we were on our way to take them home, pulled out on the beach there close to uh, the Naval Air Station in Kaneohe, and there were a group of Japanese off to our right, maybe, maybe 20 yards away. And they were having a very riotous uh, party right there. A lot of shooting firecrackers, fireworks of all kinds, a lot of laughing, a lot of talking. And it was more than just a casual meeting, uh, we thought. And we commented on it uh, among ourselves. And uh, then we dismissed it and uh, went on uh, to take the girls home and then back to the base. And uh, then the next morning, of course, the attack happened. And then a little bit later, when we got to thinking, we couldn't help but believe that those people knew that that attack was going to happen the next morning, possibly even having crew members from those Japanese submarines that were stationed around Oahu to pick up any uh, Japanese airplanes that might go down at sea. So uh, that could have been a, an indication to us, which of course we couldn't tell that at the time. Didn't have a dream that there was anything going to happen the next day. So, um, so was this just a situation where, you know, they, they could have, you think they had some forewarning, those Japanese? Oh, I'm, oh, now that I have read a lot, there were many people in on Oahu living there around Honolulu who knew that the attack was coming. And a part of the story is that they hung white bed sheets on their uh, clotheslines and that sort of thing, you know, don't. Don't bomb me, don't shoot me, I'm one of you. And uh, consequently, uh, I know, and I've read enough to know that there was a lot of uh, uh, spying going on there, uh, both around Pearl Harbor and uh, any other place, Kaneohe, I'm sure. So tell me about the morning of Pearl Harbor. Sure. What is your wake up? Well, we did not have the duty, my friend and I, so we slept in. Uh, got up around, uh, oh, I guess it was around 7 or a little earlier than that. Went in and uh, got cleaned up and got dressed and we were going to the exchange to have breakfast because the uh, mess hall would have been closed about that time. So we started uh, out the door of the uh, barracks toward the exchange and as we walked out there was an airplane that flew across right in front of us. And it was painted uh, kind of dark green, had what we call meatballs, round red circles on the side and under the wings. And uh, so the Army had been having maneuvers for a couple of weeks before that, and we were used to that going on. So I commented to him that uh, they were really making it look realistic. Uh, and that they had even plane, painted their planes and to make them look you know, like a possible enemy. And so the plane went out of sight and uh, we headed on toward the exchange. Uh, and all the way over there, uh, we saw another plane, which went behind a hill uh, where the bachelor officer's quarters were located. And he never came back out. Well, we figured that he had just stayed low and we didn't see him, so we didn't, didn't think anything about that. Walked into the, uh, right to the cafe and the ladies that were working there were crying and uh, just as scared as they could be, it was obvious. And so we said, what's going on? What's, what's the matter in here? 
He said, well, if you come over here and look out the window uh, toward the hangar, you will see what it is. So we did, looked down the toward the hangar, and there was smoke coming up from the planes and, and, and from the hangar, and uh, men from the barracks were running down in that direction. So then we started to realize that there might that someone was attacking us and for real so then we headed toward the hangar because obviously that's where uh, the only place that we could go to do any good so uh, we ran, went ran down to the hangar as well and when we got there why uh, uh, there of course was the effects of the bombing and strafing the planes were lying on their sides uh, and the uh, Hangar had a hole in the top of it where they had dropped a bomb down through. People were wounded, so uh, we didn't have any guns. There were guns in the planes, but we couldn't mount them, and a 50 caliber machine gun is very heavy. You try to hold it and shoot it and hit anything, uh, forget it, because you can't hold it uh, steady enough to do that. So then we started uh, picking up the wounded people and taking them up to the uh, to the dispensary. We didn't have a hospital or anything like that, just a dispensary, and carried them up there in anything that we could find that would run, like a car or, or a truck that might be there. And uh, there, were, there were enough of them to show that they didn't have beds enough for them, and they were lying in the passageways and all that sort of thing. And uh, then, after we uh, did that, we came back down and started moving airplanes around, getting them away from each other so that the ones which were not as badly damaged wouldn't be burned or set on fire by the other planes that were burning. Uh, so uh, during that time, there was a lull uh, because one flight had gone over and disappeared, and uh, another one, uh, someone looked up toward the north, and here they came again, and they said, oh, here they come again. So, not having anything to shoot with, uh, we looking for a place to get out of the way. Uh, in the meantime, there was a chief gunner's mate named uh, uh, Fenn, and uh, he knew where the guns and where the ammunition, and he knew how to get into to it. So he set up a 50 caliber machine gun on a gun mount, which they used to work on the guns with and to test them after they'd finished working. So he stood out there for, uh, during the entire attack, the second attack, firing at those planes, being wounded, I believe it was 22 times, uh, wouldn't leave, stayed there, and consequently he was uh, uh, given the Medal of Honor, and uh, which he did absolutely deserved. Uh, Injured 22 times, you said? Yes. Wow. Now, uh, you may have said this. What what field is this? What is the formal name? This is Naval Air Station Kaneohe Bay. Kaneohe Bay. Okay. Across the island of Oahu from Pearl Harbor. So north. The east. Northeast. Wow. So you're, you're there when the very first planes, because yes. they came in from the north. Right. That's right. Wow directly uh, over the uh, Pali and uh, down on the east coast there, uh, you'll find that bay. The guns and ammunition in the squadron were always kept under lock and key unless there was someone there uh, during the day working hours. Uh, but nobody that we knew, that I knew, had a key to it. We really maybe didn't know exactly where it was. and. Uh, so they were trying to get uh, guns out of planes, and you could do that, but uh, there was no place to mount them. You know, you couldn't lay it on somebody's shoulder. You could, but, but you would never hit anything. But had we all had gun mounts, and there were only about two of those, uh, you, they were low. A lot of those planes were low, and I'm sure that we could have shot down many more of them. As far as I know, there was only one shot down there at Kaneohe, and uh, that's the one that disappeared behind the mountain, small mountain, and didn't come back up. 
Now, I know that uh, they, I believe the total I read was 11 planes, U.S. planes that were able to take off. Were any of those from your field? No. Yours None was... of our planes were able to take off. We had just gotten back out there about uh, two to three weeks earlier with brand new planes. We had flown our old PBYs back to uh, San Diego, which is where they were made. And uh, we flew some of them on over across to Jacksonville and and uh, places along the way where the Navy had bases. And then we went back out to San Diego, picked up brand new PBY-5s. Uh, they were still seaplanes, they were not amphibians. And uh, uh, they were brand new. But all of them were uh, unflyable in the, in, at that field, at that Naval Air Station, except two. And uh, one or two days later, uh, two crews were uh, assigned the job of flying those over to Fort Island, my crew being one of those. So we flew the two planes over there, and the reason they took them there was because uh, at Fort Island, th that's where all of the squadrons had been previously, and their maintenance was better. So they wanted to start patrolling as quickly as possible, and that way they could uh, keep them keep them flying. Now. You're a radio operator, but are you also flying at this point at all? Uh, not flying. The, well, but you're riding occasionally. In there. He would let us sit up in the cockpit mm. and maybe hold the controls, something like that, but never a, a takeoff or a landing. Uh, so now, one thing that stuck out in my mind from the Pearl Harbor attack was you were able to get to these weapons because someone knew. Were you were you able to actually shoot yourself at the Japanese planes? No. And we didn't have any place to mount those guns. Right. Like I said, there were only two of those, and they were for maintenance purposes. And so he had one of them, this chief had one of them, and I don't remember seeing the other one actually right there. So these guns aren't ones that you can just hold, they have to be oh, on no. the plane? They're big 50 caliber machine guns, and they're very heavy. You know, you, you're lucky to hold them like this, much less aim them at a moving airplane and expect to hit anything. So, first wave comes, and before you can realize it, the second wave's coming. Yes. Uh, you realize that you're essentially defenseless. Were right. you able to take cover during this time, or was there a tangible action that you could actually do to help? Uh, maybe put out fires or something, or is, is there something you're able to do well, in all this chaos? Well, that's what we have been doing, yeah. but when they're coming in to drop bombs and strafe you, uh, the main thing in your mind is find a place where they can't hit you, of course, uh, because we couldn't do anything defensively to uh, stop them from doing it. And they had been, uh, they were going to uh, bury a, a fuel tank right there, so there was a hole in the ground. Well, three or four of us got in that hole. Well, of course, it looked like uh, it was wide open, which it was. We could have gotten up against the side of it probably, but we decided, well, this is not a very good place to be. So we got out of there, and believe it or not, uh, we went into the hangar, and there was a room where the sliding doors, those big sliding doors, go into. All of them fold in side by side there, and it looked like concrete walls. But we went in this room that looked like a concrete room. Well, sure enough, while we were there, they dropped a bomb right in the middle of the hangar again, and it, uh, and it blew, and I was looking out the door at a young man who was sitting uh, on one of these doors. Well, he kind of stood up, and then he sat right back down, and he didn't move anymore. So after uh, that bomb had gone off, and after the whole thing was over, of course, we started checking people. He's still sitting there and uh, not moving. So uh, what had happened when that bomb went off, a very, very tiny piece of shrapnel went in his chest directly into his heart, and he was killed instantly. So, and he, he died in a sitting position. Oh, yes, he did. He just raised up, died, and sat right down. Who was, down. do you remember his name? No, I do not. I, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a friend of mine. You don't know everybody in the squadron, and they're all uh, in different uh, groups because they're either a mechanic, or they're an electronics person, or they're uh, an ordnance person, or whatever. So and you saw him actually yes, get killed? Yes, I, I saw him actually stand up. When he got hit, apparently he felt it, 
and stood up, but almost instantaneously he died as well. Was that the only casualty you saw that day? That's the only one I saw when it happened. I saw a lot of them uh, after the first attack, and we were taking those people up to the dispensary to get them taken care of. Uh, one of my one of my friends, a uh, fellow by the name of uh, Crownover, was a radioman as well, and he uh, lost an arm, and you know, of course, tourniquets and all that sort of thing. And, and he was able to stay in the Navy and do certain types of jobs. Was did you lose any friends in Pearl Harbor that you could recall by well, name? Well, my crew. Uh, now, I hadn't been in this particular crew very long, but I was in this crew. After I left to go to flight school, that was about uh, two to three weeks after the attack, my crew was out on patrol, they came back in, bad weather, night, and they couldn't find their way back to Kaneohe. Uh, and, I, and I can't tell you why they didn't go someplace else, I don't know the answer to that. But they flew into a place called Makapu'u Point, which is not too far around the island uh, from Kaneohe, if you're going around the island back to Honolulu. And they flew directly into that, exploded, burned completely. There was not enough, enough stuff left to even carry it down off the mountain. So they left it there, and then later they put a plaque up there with their names and uh, the what crew it was, what squadron they belonged to, and what happened to them. And uh, I was able to see that in 2011 when we group of people who are here in Pensacola went out there for the observance of December the 7th. Now, sorry, crew of, tell me the vehicle's name, the ship's name, or I guess what kind is it? Oh, the, the airplane? Yeah. It's a PBY. P B Y. And is there like numbers after? It's made, yeah. yes. Uh, that was a PBY 5, but it was made by Consolidated there in San Diego. And they are strictly a seaplane, been around a long time, very good plane, uh, dependable. Uh, we never had to worry about uh, something was going to happen to it because it was well built. It had uh, retractable floats out on the end of the wings. They would come up and, and fit right into the end of the wings. And uh, then you had no wheels down, you had no anything uh, that would uh, slow you down or resist its flight.